This is the introduction to the book Isaiah 53 and the Day of the Lord. This is a book that was dictated to me by God as he dictated the Torah to Moses. I am the man described in Isaiah 53. I'm also the man described in Isaiah 11. The Spirit of God upon me enters me as he did Ezekiel. At that moment, I could hear God's words. That's how he talks to a man. <clears throat> so, I am God's righteous servant, Moshiach, and quite a bit more. And this will tell you about it. Introduction. This is scripture. It was divinely received. Every word is God's. He taught it to me. And he would tell me, Keith, go to your computer. Write this down. Type it. Every bit of it. It's not canonized. But at one time, the scrolls weren't canonized either. That took many, many years before the Hebrew Bible was put together. But it was still scripture. Isaiah 53 begins with Isaiah 52, 13 through 15. There was a bad divisioning of chapters. It should have been 52, 13 should have been 53, 1. But that's where the description of the righteous servant begins. Three verses that are combined by quotes, which nobody seems to know about. Followed by Isaiah 53, 1 through 6. Six verses that are also combined by quotes. Quotes start on verse 1. The quote ends at the end of verse 6. And what it does is it ties everybody in those six verses together. You know, it begins, who can believe what we have heard? Well, that's the same people who say he was wounded for our sins. Our guilt was placed upon him. Words I'm going to explain to you. It's not what the Christians think, not by any stretch of the imagination. 52, 13. <clears throat> Indeed, my servant shall prosper, be exalted, raised to great heights. From a sinful man whose life has been lowly, full of grievous events, and serious injuries. A man of pain and suffering familiar with disease. That the Spirit of God alights upon him, and he did. And he rises like a tree crowned to the great height of God's righteous servant, Moshe. 52.14 Just as the many were appalled at him, so marred was his appearance, unlike that of man, his form beyond human semblance. This is the beginning of identifying the righteous servant as a man with disfigurement as though afflicted by God, blemished and crushed with disease. He is not a man without defect and scars, such as lambs and rams for a sin offering and guilt offering in the Torah. Certainly not a description of Jesus Christ. Just so, this is 52.15, just so he shall startle many nations Kings shall be silenced because of him, for they shall see what has not been told them, shall behold what they never have heard. And that's what you're about to experience. Nations, the Gentiles, startled, and kings, leaders of nations, silenced by seeing there are four men to come. And only God's righteous servant is to describe. That would be Moshiach, the descendant of King David, a servant and righteous, Elijah, a servant and righteous, and the prophet like Moses, Moses, a servant and righteous. But we have only one description of a righteous servant. Only God's righteous servant is described 
and inherently and implicitly, God's righteous servant is also the descendant of King David, as the sages just believed, Elijah, and the prophet like Moses. They shall be startled and silenced to hear that God's righteous servant is a Gentile, according to the scripture. And that Jesus, being a Jew, cannot be God's righteous servant. Cannot be. Isaiah 63 says, God comes from Adam. That is interpreted in Judaism to be Christianity. Meaning he is coming from a Christian country. And of the people, the Jewish people, God's people, none are with him. None are with him. His visible representation is a Gentile speaking and writing his words just as Moses did. Okay, now we're getting to actual chapter 53, verse 1, beginning in a quote. Who can believe what we have heard? Upon whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who can believe what we have heard? This is Midrash from, uh, you take a part of a verse and you break it down. The witnesses ask, who can believe that God redeems the Jewish people by the new covenant of sin forgiveness that writes sore on your heart. That is delivered by the messenger Elijah. Who receives it from the angel of the covenant. Who is the angel of God's presence. Wherever God's presence is. So is this angel. And this angel's body is not human form and wings. This angel's body is the spirit of God. That's why he's the angel of his presence, the spirit of God. And he most definitely is a person, although Judaism doesn't recognize it. And because of that, they get a lot of other things wrong. Who can believe? Redeemed by the covenant of friendship that comes with his servant David, a shepherd, not the king, when he sanctifies Israel by having the third temple built on his holy Mount Zion. Doesn't have to be on the temple mount. He doesn't want it on the temple mount. He says the temple mount is too small. It's tainted by Islam and Jordan controls it. We've got to keep it on Mount Zion and we need a lot of land. God expects hotels to come up around this temple so that Jews across the world can take their two weeks vacation in Israel. Go to the temple in the morning or in the evening and uh, explore Israel. It's a beautiful country. It's incredible what they had done. Who can believe, redeemed by speaking to his prophet again as he spoke to Moses. Face to face and friend to friend. And all by and with one man the Lord calls my righteous servant, Moshiach. God's righteous servant who fulfills and completes the remaining prophecies of God in this, the day of the Lord. This isn't the day of the Lord. It's very easy to show you how I know that. Okay, it's really quite simple. There's no complication that this is the day. None. But I'll get to it. The remaining prophecy to be filled is the delivery of two covenants. Two specific covenants and the arrival of the four righteous servants described in Isaiah 53. It's the anointed one, the shepherd God calls my servant David, Elijah, who is taken to heaven and returns as a messenger of the new covenant and recounsels the member of the Jewish families, one to the other, through Judaism and righteousness, and clears the way for the Lord. That would be clearing the way to have the third temple built, because that's God's purpose that might prosper. He mentions in Isaiah 53, a purpose that might prosper. Well, he tells us in Malachi 3 what the purpose is. I'm returning to my temple. 
And he calls it his eternal temple. And he knows it's not there right now. It, this is how you know. He says, I'm going to place my temple amongst you. You shall no longer be the taunts of nations. But that's all he says about that. He didn't say anything about the world exalting the Jewish people. That was made up by Rambam and taught by your rabbis as though God says it in the Hebrew Bible. False teaching. And clears the way for the Lord. And the prophet like Moses who wrote the Torah at the command and direction of God and was his veritable mouthpiece on earth. Upon whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? His arm of strength and power that brings victory, vindication, salvation, and redemption is revealed on God's righteous servant that would be me. Through his righteous servant, God does not perfect the world. As Ramban tells us, he does, but the Hebrew Bible doesn't, neither does God. Another false teaching. He has his vindication upon Christianity, Islam, and the Gentiles of the world who tormented the Jewish people. Does this sound like the Messianic era that is taught by your rabbis? Not even close. And that came from Rambam, and he simply just made it up. 53.2 for he has grown by his favor like a tree crown, like a tree trunk out of arid ground. He had no form or beauty that we should look at him, no charm that we should find him pleasing. Okay, he has grown by God's favor out of arid ground. God comes from a Gentile country with a Gentile. To the Jewish people, God's righteous servant coming from a country of Gentiles, and being a Gentile, he would have no form or beauty or charm to them. But if he comes from a Gentile country with God to Israel and converts Orthodox to Judaism and becomes an Israeli citizen, he will have form, beauty, and charm to the Jewish people. 53 verse 3. He was despised, shunned by men. And you'd be surprised at this. So was King David until he became king. I have a video on it. A man of suffering, familiar with the disease. As one who hid his face from us, he was despised. We held him of no account. They've been doing that to me for years. They don't like, you know, Toby has got 65,000 followers. And he teaches them Isaiah 53. Is Israel. And they believe him. Even though they don't bother to find out what his argument for that is. And if they did look. And I've got it all over the internet. They'll find out. His argument. His commentary. His midrash. On 53. Particularly 53.10. Is an absurdity. And feel free to tell him I said so. It's an absurdity. Despised, shunned by men. He will be despised. He has been despised and shunned for declaring that he is the anointed one and the Lord's righteous servant. Described in Isaiah 53. Christians will despise and shun the man who startles nations and silences their leaders for announcing that he is the anointed one. The Jewish people have been waiting for, and God's righteous servant, Isaiah 53, because that means it's not Jesus. And it isn't. He cannot be Isaiah 11. I'll get to that. And he most certainly was never afflicted by God or crushed with disease. He wasn't exposed to death. He died. And he did not have, to have long life or see his children, of which he had none. 53 cannot be Jesus Christ. Period. That 
No, that's back to the, it can't be Jesus. The Jewish people will despise and shun him for the reason they expect and have been taught, another false teaching, that the anointed one is Jewish, not a Gentile. In the Messianic era of exaltation, redemption, restoration, and the world to come, they had been taught of by their sages and rabbis will not be occurring. They're not going to like to hear it. They're going to say, well, that's what we say Judaism is. Well, that's what you say it is. But that's not what God says it is. Do you teach man's word as Judaism? And why do you include the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? You teach his word. To the extent your word conflicts with it, you need to go to your 65,000 people, Toby is saying, and no telling how many Jews for Judaism have, has, and you need to straighten them out and tell them all the places you've been wrong. It's the only way either one of you will see the scroll of remembrance on this, the day of the Lord, which is so easy to see. This, the day of the Lord, God creates the scroll of remembrance, Malachi 3. He's returning. Said he would and he's here. Jesus said he was going to return, but he didn't. He had five false prophecies on his return. Five. I've even got a top ten lies of Jesus Christ you can find in the New Testament. It is the nature of people to despise and shun a man who has no visible proof to substantiate his claims that God speaks to him as God spoke to Moses. That he is a man prophesied to come in the Hebrew Bible. That he is a messenger and deliverer of covenants of God. That the Spirit of the Holy God has alighted upon him. And that he offered himself for guilt to God. That's the phrase that Toby Singer got wrong. Totally made his whole account of 53.10 being Israel an absurdity. He, mis he, he mistranslated the Hebrew to English. And there's a lot on that in here. I'm not going to get too technical. But God crushes a man with disease that he would offer himself for guilt. That is literally the translation. Somehow Toby Singer says, this says he is a guilt offering. Let's go to Leviticus. So he goes and revives God's animal sacrificial laws, and he bases it on the Holocaust, so he adds human beings. Human beings, as though he's God himself. Because only God could do that. It's his laws. It's his decision. He added six million murdered Jews that are supposed to receive long life, make the many righteous by their knowledge, and see their children. That's not the murder of the Holocaust. I don't know what happened to him. He's a smart man. He's intelligent. He can read. He can tell you what it says. But somewhere along the line, something happened. I don't know. Maybe he thought this is the best way to fight Christianity as an anti-missionary. And he just flat out lying. But, what, but you know who he's hurt? He's hurt his God. We can't. I'm shunned and despised and held no account. I can't get to Israel. God didn't go to Israel without me. He's got to have his Moses. He's got to have a man that he talks to and tells me, go tell the Jews this. Just like he told Moses, go tell the Israelites this. And he gave them a chapter in the book. I'm giving you chapters from a book. At his direction. God's producing this little video. Yeah, I can hear you the whole time I'm talking. I've been with you in 15 years. And I'll get to that, you'll know why. A man is suffering, familiar with the disease. God's righteous servant, which is me, is a man who has a life full of pain, suffering, injuries, wounds, Accustomed to illness and disease. That's why God dictated the second book. It's called The Life of God's Righteous Servant of Isaiah 53. It's my life. And, it, you know, it's not going to bore you to death because it's not very long. And it really focuses on things like wounds, pain, suffering, uh, the grievous things that have happened to me.
who hid his face from us. He was despised. We held him to no account. A man who is despised and held on no account is not going to go out among the people until, until the perception of him changes and he's asked to. Yet, this is uh, 53 verse 4. Yet it was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering that he endured. We accounted him plagued, smitten, and afflicted by God. It was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering that he endured. Okay, the sickness and suffering is not being righteous. The witnesses suffer the sickness of not being righteous and not being in right standing with God. God's righteous servant suffers by bearing and enduring the big six words of Isaiah 53. Wounding, chastisement, punishment, bruising, crushing, and maltreatment laid on him by the words and power of God to make him suitable as a prophet for his purpose that might prosper. I call it God's prophet boot camp. It gets you in shape to do what you got to do. The righteous servant bearing up to and enduring what God calls the fire of refinement removes the sickness and suffering of unrighteousness of the Jewish people for being guilty of not following the teachings, the laws, the commandments, and rules of God, and the feelings of guilt that come with that. The many in the multitude who heed my words and act accordingly will be healed of their sickness and suffering. I don't vicariously die and take the sins of all people. Okay? But I have put to an ordeal that is not mentioned in 53. But God has a backup for that. It's the book of Ezekiel. Because he goes through the fire of finite too. As a matter of fact, he probably fits about five or six of the verses of 53. Uh, and I'll be getting, in, uh, I'll give you more detail on that. We accounted him as plagued, smitten, and afflicted by God. Plague means to continual trouble or distress. As in, he has been plagued by ill health. Smitten in biblical times meant struck as with a severe hard blow. Afflicted means grievously affected with trouble, as by a disease, or disfigured as at birth, as though cursed by God. Remember, we were appalled at him, this and that. I was afflicted by God at birth. He says, I touched you in the womb. <laughs> I don't have a right breast. My right shoulder is shorter than my left. And my right arm is shriveled. There's just about no muscle in it. This figure. <clears throat> this described the man considered as regarded as, as one that God does not like. A man whose life is full of bad events, sickness, and suffering. God's righteous servant will have had, and I did, persistent hardships and troubles. Severely injured. Uh, that would include a gunshot to my abdomen from two feet away. I'm talking some serious injuries and almost losing my right leg. A person with flawed features from birth was considered cursed and afflicted by God. King David would have nothing to do with the lame, blind, and disfigured because he felt God didn't like him. It's just the belief of long ago. It's still around today, but not like it was in antiquity in the Middle Ages. Chapter uh, Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was wounded because ours of our sins, crushed because of our inequities. He bore the chastisement that made us whole, and by his bruises we were healed. This is the same crafty writing of God on 53. The only man who can explain 53 to you is me, the actual righteous servant. And God wrote it that way. It's a proof of who I am. That I can show it to you, explain it to you, and nobody else can. And it also has something to do with setting up Christianity, particularly for this day. See, these are words they would all apply to Jesus. He 
took this for us. He took this for us. That's not what it is. I did because I agreed to the fire of refinement. If he would make me his righteous servant, Moshe, his prophet. And it takes all those words to get you where he wants you. He believes that pain and suffering makes you stronger. As a Jewish people, you should know that to be fact. You're still here. And you have created a most beautiful country full of intelligent, strong people. God's chosen, and he wants to live amongst you again as he lived among the tents of the Israelites forever, never defeated and dispersed again as part of the covenant of friendship. The book of Ezekiel is the key to understanding Isaiah 53. The purpose of Ezekiel was to be a prophet. By the way, I'm reading from the book itself that God dictated. This is all, these are all his words. And teach of righteousness to the exile of Assyria and Babylon by bringing them to repentance with restitution. To prepare him, God said, and here's the key, here's the fire of refinement. Go ask a rabbi, where's the fire of refinement in the Bible? They'll tell you, I don't know what talking about. Well, here it is. It's in quotes. I will make your face as hard as theirs and your forehead as brazen as theirs. I will make your forehead like adamant, harder than flint. Do not fear them, and do not be dismayed by them. You know, nobody's born to be a prophet. God's got he's, certain characteristics he looks for. With Moses, he murdered a man in anger. And that's the kind of temperament God said, boy, I get that straight back. And uh, I'm going to have me somebody who'll do some things. Ezekiel's the same way. He has a furious spirit. Probably don't think of Ezekiel that way, but uh, he went through the fire. Bless his heart. I will make your face as hard as this. Do not fear them. And God maltreats and punishes Ezekiel for the punishment. He says, for the punishment of the houses of Israel and Judah for their sins. Well, that's what the punishment will be for. See, that's in 53 too. He was wounded for our sins. So is Ezekiel. Again, it's the fire. I just described the fire of fire. See, it God's boot camp. For 430 days, Ezekiel is punished, confined by the power of God to his house that's cut off from the land of the living, which is Isaiah 53, 8. Removed from society, pinned to the ground, crushed and bruised, eating nothing but bread, and chastised by the words of God. He says some pretty mean things to him. You, you don't really pick up on it because of God's craft, the way he writes it. It's just like you don't see. You just read over it. Verse 6. We all went astray like sheep, each going his own way. And the Lord visited upon us, upon us the guilt of all of us. We went astray like sheep. The Jewish people who are the witnesses and the speakers, verses 1 through 6, stopped following the laws of God in one manner or another. And the Lord visited upon Ezekiel, upon him, the guilt of all of us. This would happen in the day of the Lord, which is today. When God requires a man to be his visible representation and speak and write his words, I've already written his words and I'm speaking them right now. As Moses did in the day of the Lord. A Gentile is tested by God. In the day of the Lord, a Gentile is tested by God And upon passing the test, the man becomes the righteous servant, Moshe, and his servants, David, Elijah, and the prophet like Moses. The test is, will he offer 